You're listening to Design Between the Lines, the only design and home furnishings podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry. It's here that I get a chance to sit and chat with the influencers shaping the industry into what it is today. This episode of Design Between the Lines is brought to you by Furnishings Design Incorporated. For over 15 years, FDI has been providing commercially successful product designs, marketing research, and strategy to manufacturers and marketers of fine furnishings products. FDI's approach to design and product development is based on optimism, collaboration, creativity, innovation, and a focus on end consumers' lifestyles and the client's brand image. Find out more at www.furnishingsdesigner.com. Today, I'm delighted to speak with Gail Doby, co-founder of the distinguished Gail Doby Coaching and Consulting Firm. Gail has built a career channeling her business acumen to help designers bridge the gap between their creative and entrepreneurial work. She has fostered the success of countless clients through a warm yet uncompromising approach to building their business skills as well as boosting their unique creative voice. She has also been known to engage in various speaking engagements at markets and events around the country. Gail, it's good to have you on Design Between the Lines. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you the magic question is, what (laughs) attracted you to the design industry? How did you get into this thing? That's a great question. I actually... Interestingly, I have a degree in finance, and when I graduated from college the first time, I went to work for a Fortune 500 company, and I actually called on architects and designers. So I have literally been in the industry since the day I first graduated from college. And so um, years after that, I had friends that would start asking me to help them with their homes, and I did it for free for, for years. And then finally, when I ended up in Denver, I, I met my husband and he wanted to go back to school. And I said, well, you know what? My friends are flying me around the country to help them with their houses. So I think I probably need to get a, a degree in design. And so I ended up going and getting a degree in design. So that's how I ended up um, in the industry. And it's just been a progression. And every single step has been instrumental in helping me be where I am here today. So you've got a business side education and Mm -hmm. then you've got the degree in design. So obviously the business side kind of brought you back into the business side of design. Right. Um, Were there any early mentors of yours uh, as you kind of grew into this and grew into this business? That's a, that's another interesting question. And that's one (laughs) thing I've always regretted is I never really had a mentor. And I was one of those people that when I was working or going through school, I did an internship with an architect. And so that wasn't really the background that would help me in the design business. And by the time I was in my last semester of school, I was working full-time in my own business. And then there was no going back. So I said, well, I guess I'm going to figure it out on my own. And that's what I did is I (laughs) I just had to (laughs) learn the school of hard knocks and Mm -hmm. jump in with both feet and uh, teach myself. Well, from the design side, were there any um, big inspirations as you got your design degree and you kind of were out there doing things, you maybe saw some things that other people were doing? Anybody that was uh, inspirational to you from that side of things? You know, there probably, uh, thank you for asking that. I, I think that there probably weren't any people that I would call out at this time that people would know of, but I did mm-hmm. really admire some of my teachers in school and some of the people in the, in the local area that were designers. And it was interesting because when I grew up with a mother who loved mid-century modern and very contemporary. And when I first moved to Denver, it was a very traditional market. So I had to learn how to do traditional design. And, um, and so here I am now. And of course, what I would really love more than anything is a completely modern home with um, very contemporary furnishings. So it's a little bit different than what I'm, I'm living with now because uh, you know, it was different. So I would say that the people that I was learning from at the time when I was starting here in Denver were people who were doing more traditional design at the time. And, and now it has evolved and a lot of people are moving toward that more contemporary look. 
So we talked a little bit before the, the show began a little mm -hmm. bit about <laughs> your busy life. So let's, let me ask you, the, you know, the, this is the bomb questions. What's a day in <laughs> your life like? Oh days. my gosh. Well, it depends on which day you're asking me, but if you ask me on most days, I'm on Zoom all day. So oh I am on here from beginning of the day to the end of the day in nonstop conversations with clients and coaching and uh, leading groups and interviews and you name it. Um, oh meeting gosh. with people who are influencers in the industry and talking to them about what needs to happen and what we can do together and how to collaborate. So I'm on Zoom all day. That's pretty much it. And then when I'm traveling, when I'm at uh, when I am on the road, I am in fully invested in meeting with as many of my clients as I can. Often I'm doing special events or helping them with VIP days when I'm on the road. So uh, they're they're pretty intense days. All days are intense. I was going to say, yeah. So, so in, in meeting with these folks and in 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 uh, basically connecting and collaborating with the folks you do on a daily basis, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's kind of how you stay ahead of the curve uh, on the business side, at least, or at least in design for sure. If you're collaborating, well, you know, interestingly, I, I have not been doing uh, design for about five years because I'm so busy in the consulting coaching side. I don't have time to do design, and I am, uh, and I have a great team and a couple of things about the way we operate. We are hundred percent virtual and we have been for 12 and a half years. And so this for us was not a change when COVID hit, we were all just still operating as normal. And, um, it, you know, it just, it's just busy. It's, we are very full with the things that we are constantly doing. So the collaborations are often just helping our clients growing to another level and, helping them solve problems. It's a, uh, it's a very full life. It's a very rewarding uh, career. I love what I do. Well, I, one of the things that intrigued me in, in the introduction, I mentioned that also because it, it's, it's mentioned in your book as well, uh, which by the way is business breakthrough right here. There it is. Mm -hmm. And thank you thank for you. that wonderful copy. And, um, Absolutely. Uh, let's talk a little bit about boosting clients' creative voice. I mean, now mm. they have a creative voice. Some of them may not believe in it. Do you have that? Oh, Do you yes. have some of those <laughs> moments where, where, you know, they have one and you know, they've got one, but maybe they don't. And you have to bring that out in them. Well, when people come to us, they're not coming to us to teach them design or how to be a better designer. They're teaching, we're teaching them how to be better business people. And our goal is to teach them to be the CEO of their business. And with that is training people to be confident. And I think that's the thing that is one of the biggest things we try to teach them. And I, I love this one story, one of my clients told not too long ago in an interview. And she said, when I first came to Gail, she told me that I had to double my fees. And so this go, goes to your question about value. And she said, I thought, how am I going to do that? And so uh, we worked it out. And then she went and had to present that to four of her male clients. And every one of them said, good for you. I need to do that. How did you do that? <laughs> so, you know, that it, to me, that's what it's all about is helping people have the courage to charge mm. what they're worth. Mm. That's, that's a significant thing because people seem to be timid mm -hmm. a lot in that, in that area. Uh, which, which means you basically, you're helping them find their creative value right? to use your, your vernacular for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me ask you, uh, with, with this direction that you're, you've gone in, uh, have you ever, ever had some, uh, Barbara Walters moments where you're sitting there with a new client and all of a sudden things dissolve rapidly, yes. possibly into tears. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Just kind of just sit there for a minute and let them collect themselves or what, <laughs> what so happens? Who's been, who's been talking to you? Cause uh, <laughs> I'm actually known for, for making people cry. <laughs> it, it's not that I'm making people cry. It's just that they have a safe place where they can come. And mm -hmm. when they come to meet with us, um, it takes a lot of vulnerability to be as open as they are, talk about their finances uh, we do some really in-depth work. We create a three-year financial plan for people. We look at their personal finances and we usually dig into why they haven't gotten where they want to go. 
Mm. And so by the time that we have these conversations, um, about 50% of our clients cry in these VIP days, including men. Um, had that just happened a couple of weeks back from one of the men that came in. And it, to me, that's a great sign because that means, first of all, they trust me. Number two, they are willing to face whatever their fears are so that they can fix their business. And everyone has something they need to fix or something that can be improved. And so to me, when somebody is open enough to, to cry openly, it means that they are ready to learn and they are ready to break through. So I love that because to me, that tells me that we have accomplished our goal. Gail, you find sometimes that, that when you first get a client on board and you, and you have your first meeting uh, with them and, uh, do you sometimes find that the problem they thought they had isn't really the problem they have, but Almost they don't always. know it? Seriously, mm -hmm. I did not yeah. know that. Wow, yeah. wow. So then that's a it's a big, I want to say a surprise moment, an aha, aha moment for them going, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was my, what the real problem was, I guess. You're wow. right. I, I had a VIP last week with a, a leadership team for a company. And uh, we were talking about it because I said, you know, you here are some of the things that you've been talking about that aren't working with your team. And I said, here's the thing. You're trying to solve the, uh, the symptom of the problem and not the real problem. So we have to get to the heart of it and we need to find the root cause of what's going on. And here are the possibilities of what it could be. And you have to figure out which one you think is most appropriate that you need to fix first. But um, and so I really do a lot of deep work with people and um, I have been known to be called the principal. <laughs> I have one client that said that she, uh, every time she did a VIP and she did, uh, I don't know, four or five with me. And she said, every time I went to see you, I always felt like I was going to the principal's office. office. <laughs> I saw that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was kind of funny, but she always knew because I, I am absolutely laser focused and I am direct. I don't, I don't mince words. Sometimes it can be a little bit, I don't ever mean to hurt people's feelings, but I'd rather tell someone the truth than to sugarcoat it. Because if we've got something to fix, I want to fix it. Let me ask you another question. This pertains to maybe less for uh, individual design designer firms where it's a, mm -hmm. a person or a couple of people, but maybe more of a, a larger firm where they have a mm -hmm. multiple, multiple folks on the team. Um, and you've got maybe a leader who started that firm, mm -hmm. some male or female that basically created uh, this firm from scratch. Mm -hmm. And they, and they, uh, they're in this room with all these people and, and, uh, and you find a moment in there where nobody is coming forth in the group because the leader who started the firm, you know, is kind of thumbs down, however you want to say that, where they're in such control, control mm -hmm. that the, yeah, that the, nobody in the firm wants to say anything in a negative or even a constructive way because they're afraid of the, I guess, repercussions. I mean, you, is that a roadblock sometimes you run into? You know, honestly, no. Um, uh, we are very careful in who we work with uh, because it's a two-way street and someone choosing to work with us and us work, uh, choosing to work with them. And so I'm looking to work with people who are open to learning and to having a beginner's mind that are willing to allow somebody to look at their business from the outside in and give them the honest feedback that they need to make the changes and do what they need to do. So I've never had somebody who was so stubborn that they wouldn't listen or that other people didn't feel like they could speak candidly with. So um, we do do a lot of work with larger firms and those larger firms typically have leadership teams. And so we'll often work with the leadership teams and, um, and I make the point with, especially when I'm first working with a new leadership team, where I'll say to the owner, um, from now on, all decisions are made with the leadership team. You do not make unilateral decisions ever. You can't do that as, um, if you are going to have a leadership team, you need to trust them and you need to involve them in every part of what you're doing. And, and you're assuming, and hopefully they've got the right people in the right seats and whatever exactly. that team is doing. Yeah. Yes. Which is, I guess, another thing that they may or may not discover that you help them 
find. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm assuming um, I'm, we're yeah. going through that right now. We have a big firm out of L.A. and they're a multi-million dollar firm and they have probably 15 people on their in their company. And I said, it's time we've got to put a leadership team together. And we we talked about it last week about who needs to be on the team. Who, who do they need to bring and how do we how do we make that happen? Um, I'm going to talk I'm talking a little bit about this from from uh, from interior design to product design right now. Sure. But a lot of that has a lot of the similar characteristics. Uh, one of the things we're, we're, we're gaining traction on right now in the industry from our perspective as uh, in, International Society of Furniture Designers, it, it, we're, we're seeing more and more women coming into the industry as, as mm -hmm. product designers. Uh, I don't think there's enough of them. I think there needs to be more. Uh, I wonder, um, in general, um, is the industry making an effort to attract more women into business, the design end of business, as well as the design field? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, too, I think that about 85% of the industry is female-owned. And, um, and most firms that I know have women that are in the leadership positions. And so that's encouraging to me. And what's really interesting and probably one of the things I focus on with people is that I want to transform people's thinking about the fact that they're a designer, but that they are a business owner who happens to be doing design. So it's a completely different twist. And that's true, whether they're furniture designers, whether they're interior designers. And I think that we do have a, a predominant number of female-owned firms. We do have some male-owned firms, um, but we also have partnerships. So we see a, a wide variety out there. But what I do see is that with such a predominance of female-owned firms, we also have some of the challenges that come with that, with women who have children and maybe have been more of a caretaker role and now they're really focusing on their businesses and they need to get serious about running their business over just um, having a passionate job that they love. Which brings me to a good question at this juncture and that is um, a lot of clients I'm sure have come into your the first meetings or even Later on, as you're engaged with them in, in this effort, you, you find that they are, <clears throat> maybe it's not all about the money. Maybe it's about, for them, the work-life balance mm -hmm. and, and obviously, yes. bottom line. But they want to somehow have a little more efficiency in having a life <laughs> and, and working, too. And I, which is it more of? Is it, is it both work-life balance and, of course, the bottom line? Or what are you finding more of uh, the problems? I mean, are well, out there? a lot of people come to us because they want to fix their bottom line. So that's right. number one. Number one. Okay. Number one. And uh, it's a common issue for people to say, I want more time with family. And so we teach them how to set priorities in the way they manage their time. And we have some unique views on how to do that. And people love it because they can see that they can immediately make some changes. But the reality is that you really do have to scale in order to get to a point where you can have more work-life balance, which sounds counterintuitive. But the reality is, is if you are the design director and you're doing um, a great deal of the design work plus running your firm, you don't have the freedom and flexibility that somebody who has a firm that has a leadership team does. So the idea is, is to help people and they have to make the decision they're willing to do this, but if they can scale up to a firm where they're at least eight to 10 people, they're going to have more work-life balance and they're going to have more choices about how their business operates and they will be less involved in some of the things they dislike the most. So we help people get there. That's awesome. That is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, so within this, the structure of bringing some business acumen to designers who may not have that the skill set. They didn't start with it. They they need to, in some cases, learn more, but also, uh, as you said earlier, have a little bit more of a regimented st style of getting things done in their own business. Um, is there a, 
are some of them missing? They're probably pretty good at asking their clients questions, but I think in your book you mentioned that some don't interview their clients well enough to know what what their needs are, and they find they have to keep coming back to to build up that knowledge base they have on that particular client. Um, some they may pass on a client because, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, it just wasn't mm-hmm. a fit, right? And yet they've got another one that this client might uh, might recommend them to, even though they didn't have business from that client who recommended them, mm-hmm. just because they were handled in an open way. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that Absolutely. something that you, you all talk about with your clients? We do. And I think it's really important to know that um, <laughs> I, I think about one of my clients who said, I thought there was a rule book for how you run your business. And she said, I found out when I got into the design business, that was not the case. And, um, and so there are some best practices, I think. And those are some things that because of being in the industry for so many years um, and having worked with so many different clients, we see things that work and things that don't. And it's really about you being a good leader in your business. And that's a leader with your clients as well as your team. And so uh, leading your, your clients is setting expectations and making sure that you fully understand what it is they want. And it is not something that is taught in design school. I think you mentioned early on in the book, you talked about um, some successes and failures that occur when people are working for someone else. Can you elaborate on that a little little bit? Uh, you know, I'm thinking there's failures. There was something mentioned about a failure when you're sometimes occur when you're working for someone else. Where does that come from? Where did that come from? Something in your experience or? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting point that you're bringing out. Um, I, I think the failures come from people not being open to learning and not being open to, um, you know, maybe getting feedback. And those failures are the worst. And that means that, that if that person isn't open to, to being getting feedback and accepting some coaching, then if they're a member of the team, then that is not a good sign overall. Then they're probably not going to be good leaders in their own businesses either. So one thing that for people, especially as they are coming out into the field. So if we start there and we talk about people coming into the field, um, you want to be a sponge. You want to learn everything possible. And you want to believe that that person that you're studying under has more knowledge than you do. And so just be asking every single question possible to understand where they're coming from, why they're making the decision, how they can do things differently. And then also look for ways that you can help that person solve a problem. And um, I would share this, and I teach this a lot to a lot of people, is that I don't, uh, part of leadership is teaching and mentoring people. And so one thing I teach them is do, do not allow people to bring the dead rat and drop it on your lap. And that means that if somebody comes to you with a problem, then they should come to you with three solutions as well. And they should have a pretty good idea of which one they'll pick and why. And then you can make the ultimate decision with them. But that is a great employee. And that person cannot fail because they are approaching it in that they're trying to figure out the solution before they go ask the question to their boss. So you can't fail if you have that kind of an attitude. And you as a manager, if you teach your employees that same thing, uh, will have very successful team members because they will understand that you're delegating the outcome and not the task. And so the person on the team has a responsibility to help make decisions and everything should not fall back on you as the owner of the business. So I guess I hope that answers it because it's kind of a little bit of both. You're really defining leader versus mm-hmm. versus a manager. You know, a leader is is collaborative. A leader is um, energizes, inspirational. Mm-hmm. Yeah, energizes their team to do things on their own. Um, you know, the world is full of critic observers, and it doesn't take much effort to be one. But those who bring ant solutions along with an observation is, is where you were headed, right? Am I correct? Absolutely. 
And if, if somebody can do that, especially the young ones that are coming into the field and have not had experience, if you, if you bring that to the company you work for, you will be a prized member of the team and you will be compensated for it because people are looking for people that can contribute and lead and um, you lead from below too. And so if you learn to lead from below where you're a member of the team, but you're saying, I've got some ideas. What would you think if we tried this? And you came to an owner with that. I think you would have an owner that would just be in total shock. So they're used to having to come up with the answers. So you come with the answers and come with some solutions and you will be uh, rewarded handsomely for that. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it right to you. Yeah. What have been your greatest successes so oh, far? Oh gosh. Well, I think the greatest success for me is uh, building a team that loves what they do. And um, I look for people who have just unique skills and um, I allow them to do their best work and I allow them to grow. So I think that's one thing, because I think when you build a strong team, they will take care of your clients and your clients will be happy and you'll create great successes. And I think the other thing that I would say is that I love how many people we've helped make so much money and achieve financial freedom and have that confidence and control and power in their lives over their businesses so that they are not overwhelmed with their businesses, but they love their businesses and they build, they also build great teams. So that's part. And then the ultimate is the ripple effect of people having financially successful businesses who can do things like set up schools in Thailand or Africa or give back to their communities and mentor other people. Um, to me, that's success is seeing the impact of what we do when we help people. Um, what was one of your biggest learning experiences? And I use <laughs> learning experiences in place of another single word. So, <laughs> which I would have talked about with myself as a, you know, one of, one of, one of the biggest uh, worst moments of introducing a product that failed or whatever. Oh from your my perspective. gosh. I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I, that's the way I refer to it as well. Well, you know, we started this business in 2008 in March oh, and oh. Uh, you probably remember October yeah. of 2008 when everything fell apart and we had our <laughs> biggest month in October of 2008. Cause we'd already pre-sold uh, like 286 people came to this event for a few hundred dollars a piece. So we did an $86,000 a month. And I said, great. We've got a business now. And of course, great timing. So like I have said many times, I wish I had a crystal ball and we struggled just like everybody else for about three or four years. And we've had struggles in this business. This has not all been uphill. And uh, because nobody has really developed, um, I think the right blueprint until I think we're getting there on our business, the right blueprint for this kind of business, because coaching and consulting is not a simple task. It is not. And, uh, and especially doing something that's partly virtual, hmm. uh, mostly virtual is took a lot of learning, but we are now getting a lot of experience with that. And we have a great team that understands how to, how to build this kind of a business. So I would say we've made lots of mistakes along the way. We've brought up products that didn't work. We've had promotions that didn't work. We had different approaches that didn't work. So we've had a lot of failures, but you just have to be able to solve the problem, move on and go to the next. Well, what's your advice to, uh, to others in leadership positions who's, or who aspire to be? I mean, we mentioned, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, what makes a good leader. You mentioned a few right. salient points there. Is there any other advice you'd give, let's say, to young people who are, you know, they're looking to a future that hopefully they might be able to uh, start their own business and then eventually be a leader in it or of it? Uh, well, I think um, I would give the advice of what I didn't take myself, which is go work for somebody for a while and get some experience and see what they're doing well and see what they're not doing well. Make those observations and make different decisions for yourself. I think that's number one. And number two, um, don't be afraid to ask questions, but also don't come in and punch the clock at five o'clock. Somebody who's going to be successful in the long haul, especially in their own business, is not going to be punching a clock and looking at how they can get out the door quickly. They're going to look at 
how can I learn absolutely everything possible about what I'm doing in this industry and this business? Because there is a lot to learn. And, uh, you know, you can't do it half halfway. You just can't. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, not that kind of a business. Oh, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you because, you know, they're let's say they're just coming out of school. Maybe they just graduate. They're graduating this coming year. Uh, you, you have to be willing to be a sponge, as you said earlier, and yeah. to take it all in and uh, make notes for your own future. Uh, well said. Well said. What's what's next for Gail? What are you going to do <laughs> next? What's what's up on your horizon? Well, I have two more books to write. I have another one that I'm hoping it'll come out next October. Um, I'm just, I now know exactly what I'm going to write and how I'm going to approach it. So that's coming up. Um, We have some new programs coming out next year. Um, We've had a podcast out for a while, so we're continuing on that. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. We, We love doing it. And I, we're building our coaching team more. We've got a few new coaches coming on board and we are building out the sales team and I've got a management team. It's just amazing. Um, it's an amazing, fun business to run. It's hard work, but I'm getting myself ready for a sabbatical, for my first sabbatical this fall. And my team is a little nervous. I'll be gone for five weeks, but I totally trust them to run the business while I'm gone. So you're going to be heading to a mountaintop somewhere in Tibet. I'm, I'm just seeing this now. <laughs> well, maybe the ocean. Um, oh, that's, good. that's kind of my deal. You know, give me some ocean time and I'm a happy girl. Oh, that is great. Now you're going to be coming to October market for those I who may be. I will. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. We look forward to seeing you in our little fair city of High Point. Uh, hey, if you got a minute, I'll show you around to all the new buildings and everything that are have been built since you've been here last. Wow. We'd love that. Yeah. I was there in June, but I didn't have much time to go around and do things. I do. I'm speaking a few places in the fall. So yeah. Oh, that's love great. to do we're that. Gonna, yeah. We're going to have, we have a new children's museum opening this nice. fall among others. I uh, got this baseball team. I don't know the rockers. Yeah. They're 50, 50. Who knows? Just nothing like your professional teams up there in Denver. Well, they're uh, not so great here either. <laughs> <laughs> From what I hear, I don't watch them, but yeah. (laughs) I hear you. Well, so let's leave our audience with uh, maybe uh, an inspirational comment from you to, especially let's think about um, young people that are just, are in the middle of school right now. Maybe they're thinking about a direction for themselves. And they're, for quite a few of our listeners are, are in the design curriculums right now. Is there anything that you would from a student perspective, give in in a word of advice to them? Well, I would say that you have to understand that this is a business. This is not just a a fun profession and that about 90% of what they do is going to be around business and process and systems, which doesn't sound very sexy. So when you go out and you go work for somebody and you do an internship, Note how they are running their systems and their processes in the business, and that will serve you well, because as you start understanding that everything is a process and you look for that, how to, how to do that, it's almost like a mathematical formula. If you can start observing that, you are going to be way ahead of your peers, because that is something a lot of people don't understand. And uh, the other thing I say to the young people that are still in school is in school, you have a a semester to do a project and that's not real world. It goes way faster than that. So learn to have speed and also perfect thing. Look for something great and try very, very hard not to uh, second guess yourself. So hopefully those are a couple of important pieces of advice I would give your young folks. Absolutely. And I don't want to leave without saying the book was great, by the way love this. Um, Where can someone find this or purchase this? It's on Amazon and um, also Barnes and Noble. You can buy it in um, either Kindle, softcover, hardcover, all of those are available. Okay. So it's Business Breakthrough by Gail Doby, ASID. And you should join ISFD too sometime. There you go. Be a member. Be a member. <laughs> Send anyway. me info. <laughs> we'll, we'll do, Gail. Listen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great. 
Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the International Society of Furniture Designers. We record in High Point, North Carolina. To find videos of these podcasts, be sure to subscribe to the International Society of Furniture Designers YouTube channel. To learn more about ISFD, visit isfd.org. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of design between the lines. Thank you.